to remind you. But life is good. Say today is the second Sunday in Lent, and uh, just a couple, about three announcements I would like to make. First of all, there's a baptismal workshop next Saturday at 9.30 for those who are considering having baptisms either for themselves or for children or even the unborn yet to be. That it's kind of a preparation to explain baptism and, and the importance of it. Then on March 31st, there's been set a special voting assembly, and it will involve also a call meeting. It will be at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, so not immediately after church. And uh, so uh, that's on March 31st. And then our Shine On event, uh, they are seeking to get 150 volunteers, and there's a sign-up in the entryway uh, over where the balloons are, if you would like to sign up for that, and we encourage you to do that. It's a community outreach, and I think it's a, got a lot of blessings that uh, were coupled with it last year, and so this year we look forward to the many ways in which God will bless the work also of shining out and shining on. The bell has called us to worship, so let's come before God's throne of grace with our, our preparation. And we do that uh, according to confessing our sins and hearing again God's words of forgiveness to us. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we are sinners by nature and by choice. We have sinned against you knowingly and unknowingly in thought, word, and deed. Only you, O oh Lord, can forgive our sins. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and he forgave me of my sins. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not have against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us, and he has given to us his grace bestowed upon us through the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is my privilege to announce to you that grace, and in this stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us stand for our call to worship, and the first part of our call to worship is from our appointed psalm, Psalm 4. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. O come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless your worship today.
Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Praise to you, O Christ. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Be gracious to me. O men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears be angry and do not sin. Offer right sacrifices. There are many who say, You have put more joy in my heart. I will lie down and sleep in peace. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and will be forever. Amen. O Lord, have mercy on us. O Christ, have mercy on us. O Lord, have mercy on us. And grant us your peace. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray to the Lord. O God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities and that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Thanks for coming up. Looks like we've got friends of all ages up here this morning. Do you mind if I talk to some of the grown-ups too this morning? Is that okay? Okay, good. Um, first of all, do you guys know the difference between right and left? Did you figure that one out yet? Sometimes it takes a little time. Jacob's going to figure it out right and left. Yeah, so you have a right hand and a left hand. And somebody usually discovers some, at some point in their life if they're right-handed or left-handed. Do we have anybody in here who's right-handed this morning? Got a few. Yeah. Anybody left-handed? Should be the other one. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I'm right-handed, and I, that means I end up doing a lot of stuff with my right hand, a lot of really important stuff, including writing. So I brought this this morning. I'm going to draw a picture on here with my right hand, and you tell me what I drew. What is it? It's a star. Yeah, good, good. Do you want to see what a star looks like when I tried to draw a star with my left hand? It did not go well at 8.15. Here, let's see. <laughs> if you didn't know that that was supposed to be a star, would you have figured that out? It's kind of messy and a little wobbly. Yeah, it turns out uh, all of my words and letters would look like that if I tried to write with my left hand. It's just not as strong. And made me think that if I had to go through life without my right hand, everything would get so much harder. Like, I have to hold this book when we're in church, and I have to, like, turn the page at some point, but if I didn't have my right hand, how am I going to hold the book and turn the page at the same time? Or sometimes you need both hands to tie your shoelaces, right? Imagine how hard it would be to try to tie your shoes if you only had your left hand. If I couldn't use my right hand, that does so many important things. We say as Christian people that Jesus sits at the right hand of his Father. And at first that might seem kind of silly. We talked about Jesus dying on the cross for us. 
so that he could pay for our sins. We talk about Jesus rising from the dead so he could give us life. But we also say Jesus sits at the right hand of his Father. So it's like he's sitting right beside his Father in heaven, so close that he can lean over and whisper to God whenever he wants to. He has God's attention all the time. He's sitting right beside Jesus. And that's a good thing for us because we can pray in Jesus' name. And Jesus, because he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, can lean over and tell God the Father all the things that we just prayed for and ask for help on our behalf. You know, some people try to go through life almost like they don't use their right hand. They don't use Jesus and his help. They don't pray and give all of their problems over to Jesus. And so they try to get through life. It's like they only have one hand and all their problems get harder and harder because they don't go to Jesus. They don't pray to him. You know, I think we could use both hands and ask Jesus for help, even in our hardest challenges and even today when we're here in church. Will you guys pray with me, please? Dear Jesus, help us pray. Help us to trust you with our greatest challenges and deepest sadness. Help us to see you at your Father's right hand, praying for us and asking him for mercy and grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good job, guys. You can go back to your seat. Don't forget your phone.
first reading for this Sunday is from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, in which Luke records the glorious ascension of Jesus to reign from the right hand of the Father. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To them he presented himself alive after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, Behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading comes from Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 through chapter 4, verses 1, in which the Apostle Paul urges fellow Christians to stand firm in the Lord. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the, Christ, the, of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. O come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. The author and perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. And is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven. Will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. fix our eyes on Jesus. My eyes are ever on the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter. All glory be to the God of our salvation. Beginning with verse 31. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, go and tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is forsaken. And I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to Christ, Christ, the Lamb of our salvation. Let us affirm our Christian faith in the words of the ancient Apostles' Creed and then immediately go into the explanation of the second article since that's our focus for the sermon series. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered. 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly the truth. You may be seated as we continue with our message now. Grace and peace to each of you in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We have made it to the point in our study of the Apostles' Creed where we confess that Jesus ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. So put yourself there in heaven's throne room. Everything is glittering and glorious. There's light beaming in from every direction, so much so that there's not even a shadow on the ground, no darkness whatsoever. Uh, the soundtrack of angels and saints are providing this heavenly harmony, and pain is a thing of the past. Tears are gone. Fears are a memory for the people of God who flood this place with their joy and their praise. And in the midst of this music and laughter, as many people as you can imagine crowd around the throne. The king is on the throne. There is God the Father. And at his right hand, the crucified, risen, and ascended Son of God. Our creed takes us to heaven's throne room to see the victorious Jesus, assuming his rightful place, a place of power, a place of honor, at the right hand of God the Father. Did you see where he was in our gospel lesson? In our gospel, Jesus is still on his way to Jerusalem, still on his way to the cross. 
We meet Jesus not enjoying heaven's perfection, but locked in a struggle with this world's imperfection. It's deceit and it's conspiracy. It's stubborn disbelief. It's smug self-adequacy. We meet Jesus confronting the hateful and the hurtful schemes of humanity. Can you put yourself there? There with Jesus, not in heaven's throne room, but there with Jesus as he puts up with other people's lies? Can you picture yourself alongside him as he confronts one broken situation, one unfortunate reality after another? Next to Jesus as his plans to bring hope and life and restoration are met with constant opposition and resistance. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under his wings, Jesus cries. But you were not willing. Something tells me this may be the easier place to picture ourselves with Jesus. Not enjoying heaven's perfection, but still locked in a struggle with this world's imperfection. It's frustrations, frustrating moments, frustrating people. This world with its obstacles and inconveniences, the missing wallet, the flat tire, the broken phone, one annoying customer service experience after another, the last minute project your kid didn't tell you about, the check that gets lost in the mail, the boss who's out to get you, the difficult diagnosis that she has cancer or that he has Parkinson's. The heartbreak of watching a marriage self-destruct, the isolation of depression or the prison of addiction, the helplessness of seeing a friend or even a child abandon their faith, academic problems, devastating floods, houses of worship being turned into the site of mass murders. This world hasn't gotten any more perfect since Jesus walked the same soil you do. And that's why we need the Apostles' Creed. As people, God's people, in the midst of this brokenness, we need to say with full-throated conviction, my Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, died, and was buried. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And it may seem strange to make a big deal that Jesus ascended into heaven, but yet Christians throughout the ages have treated this as a signature part of Jesus' story. It's in the creed, and the creed is a boiled down version of just the highlights. The creed doesn't mention any of Jesus' famous parables or the great miracles that he did, but it does save space to say he ascended into heaven and he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. So why is this so important? I want to let scripture make the case this morning that the ascended Jesus is our help and our hope. The ascended Jesus is our help in the midst of this world's imperfection. And the ascended Jesus is our hope for heaven's perfection. So first, Jesus is our help. In the midst of this world's imperfection, we have Jesus at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And at first, that might not sound like much of a comfort. Wouldn't it be better if he were here with us? Wouldn't it be better if he were here this morning preaching to you in front of Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Edmond, Oklahoma? Wouldn't it be better if he were teaching Bible class and we could go to his class? Wouldn't it be better if we could invite him to our tables for dinner, just like he ate with tax collectors and sinners? Aren't we missing out on something, something special, something unique that that first generation of Christians got to share being in Jesus' very presence? The answer is yes. Especially if you don't believe that Jesus is here. If you don't believe that Jesus is preaching to each of us through his word. That Jesus is present, is speaking every time someone opens the scriptures. We are missing out on something if we don't believe we can invite Jesus to our tables for dinner. You see, during Jesus' personal ministry on earth. He was bound by the rules of time and space. He could give a sermon on a mountain... But then he'd have to walk down to the seashore to call some disciples. He'd have to spend more time and energy going to the synagogue to drive out some demons. But the ascended Jesus doesn't have to play by any of the world's rules. Right before he ascends to heaven, Jesus says, 
I am with you always. He can be anywhere he wants at any time. Jesus can be with you here in worship just as he's with our friend down the hall in worship at the modern service. The ascended Jesus can be at the bedside of a dying child just as he's with a teenager just learning to drive or um, someone on their front porch as they punch their last time clock. The ascended Jesus is still with you in the midst of this world in perfection, still available to you in his gifts. Jesus is present. In the waters of baptism. He comes to us in this supper. He's still speaking and teaching us through his word, and he's still available in prayer. The fact that Jesus ascended to the right hand of his Father should make a big difference in our lives of prayer. We pray in the name of the ascended Jesus, confident that he brings our sufferings and our sadness to his father's throne of grace. Scripture compares the ascended Jesus to a high priest, constantly offering prayers on behalf of his people. And this high priest, Scripture says, can empathize with every frustrating moment, every broken situation, every unfortunate reality you experience because Jesus has been there. We see him in Scripture confronting the broken things of this world. And yet the perfect Son of God died to make the broken things of this world whole again, to undo the damage sin has created. He dies. He rises. And he ascends. The author of the book of Hebrews says, Since we have this great high priest who has ascended into heaven, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus is our help in the midst of this world's imperfection. From his place at the right hand of his Father, he hears our prayers. And he takes them to the throne where our God sees not us asking, but sees his very own Son pleading for us on our behalf. This is a powerful truth. It should blow open our prayer lives. We don't need to worry about finding the right words or making an appointment or having an opportunity, the perfect moment to speak to God in prayer. We don't need to worry about overloading him with coming to him too often, too much. We don't need to hesitate about approaching our Father in prayer, even if it's been a while since the last time we talked to him, because the ascended Jesus takes our prayer to his Father and ours. And seeing his Son, the Father responds to this world's imperfection by wrapping his arms around it with his mercy and grace. Not only that, when we pray in the name of the ascended Jesus, we take our personal dilemmas and disasters to the one who can actually do something about them. Here again, these are the featured verses from our Philippian greeting. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. The seat at God's right hand is not purely ceremonial. The right hand is where the power lies. And Paul says that from heaven, Jesus commands a power that enables him to subject everything to himself. There is no problem too great, no topic too dirty, no need too insignificant that it lies beyond the power that Christ yields at his Father's right hand. Once again, this should ignite our life of prayer, fueling us with confidence that however meager or messy our prayers may be, Jesus holds the power to subject this world's imperfection to his heavenly perfection. Which brings us to the second point, that the ascended Jesus is our hope for heaven's perfection. We, who are far more intimately acquainted with the shortcomings and the struggles of this world, have a hope for the world to come. And this hope is made real by Jesus' ascension. It sets a pattern, a precedent. He'll transform our humble bodies, be like his glorious body, just as heaven was waiting for Jesus when he finished his work here on earth. 
Heaven awaits the body of Christ, the believers in Christ, who until their final day carry on the work that Jesus began. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, he told his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you. Paul says it too in our reading today from Philippians. Our citizenship is in heaven. We're foreigners in this land of fighting and frustration. As heaven citizens, we're aliens in a realm of anguish and adversity. In the midst of this world's troubles and trials, its misfortune and misery, its burdens and bad breaks, we have the unwavering promise of Jesus. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will return to take you with me that you may be where I am. For Christians, the danger comes when this hope of heaven allows us to resign ourselves to the imperfection around us, when we feel satisfied with our own sin, when we don't recognize how we're contributing to the imperfection of the world around us. The danger comes when we get so preoccupied with our own place in heaven and miss the fact that there are those all around us every day who don't have the hope of heaven. They battle through this world's brokenness without the help and hope the ascended Jesus gives to us and all believers, like folks with one hand tied around their neck. We even catch Jesus' own disciples abusing the hope of heaven. In the days before Jesus' crucifixion, two of his closest disciples, James and John, Come up to him and request, allow us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, when you enter your heavenly glory. And as politely as possible, Jesus tells them, you don't know what you're asking. He says, whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first must be slave of all. James and John's bold request demonstrate that they were convinced of the hope of heaven, but they were so blinded by the glory to come that they were missing opportunities to be servants right here, right now. And we abuse the hope of heaven when we stop serving, when we stop giving and growing and learning and loving. We give up on seeing ourselves transformed by the good news of Jesus. We abuse the hope of heaven when we give up on seeing the world around us, our neighborhoods, our schools, our city, transformed by the good news of Jesus. As someone transformed by the good news, you are called to bring Jesus to the hurting. Fueled by the Spirit as an heir of heaven, you are called to transform the hopeless with the hope of heaven's perfection. The hope of heaven doesn't fuel our resignation to the world's imperfection. The hope of heaven propels us to bring glimpses of heaven into this world's imperfection. Peace in the face of anxiety. Joy in the face of sorrow. Grace, forgiveness in the face of retaliation. As the body of Christ, you and me, Jesus' own eyes and ears, his hands, his heart, are called to wrap our arms around the weak and the vulnerable, yearning to embrace them with this hope of heaven. And as citizens of heaven, we journey through this world alongside the crucified and risen and ascended Jesus, who is our hope in the midst of this world's imperfection, our help now and our hope for heaven's perfection to come. So put yourself there in heaven's throne room. Everything's glittering and glorious. There's light streaming in from every direction. You can't tell where it's coming from, but you know that there's no darkness anywhere, not even a shadow on the ground. Pain is gone. Tears are a memory. Fear is a thing of the past. And there's the throne. God the Father sits on the throne, and at his right hand, the crucified, risen, and ascended Son of God, and you. And heaven is adorned with the most beautiful decorations imaginable, the lives of of the redeemed, those held in the hope of heaven, made glorious, Christ their Savior. Amen. Jesus, I love you, and I can't wait to see you. Amen. Thank you.
us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, we are in the midst of our Lenten walk to the cross. Remind us today that our Lord Jesus has ascended to the right hand of your throne of power to rule over the world and the church. As his chosen people, remind us that our citizenship is in heaven and that your Holy Spirit uses us to give others a glimpse of your heavenly grace and glory. Let our Lenten walk to the cross be focused on serving your kingdom goals here on this side of eternity. Lord, in your mercy. Hear Lord of love, we seek your blessings upon those who are celebrating wedding anniversaries. For Nathan and Amber Johnson, Tim and Debbie Hummel, Gary and Susie McCracken, Mark and Julie Luster, Paul and Theresa Meyer, Denny and Ivan Wormson. Let the love of these couples grow stronger through every joy and sorrow until that day when one shall lay the other into your arms for eternity. Lord, in your mercy. Giver and sustainer of life, we pray for those celebrating birthdays this week. For Dwayne Hansen, Jerry Parkinson, Sarah Anderson, Haiti Jones, Nikki Dean, Dan Crosman, Zach Mitchell, Lauren Mercurio, Jeannie White, Jay Harlan, Matthew Hoban, Gene Bauer, Elena Hartfield, Christian Cantu, David Maine, Michael Shuragar, Jennifer Ochoa, Ryan Williams, Charlie Herman, Elida McCain, Luciana Gibbons, Casey Hora, Brett Hatchett, Shauna Barker, Larry Whitaker. Let them have joy on their special day and use them as your instruments of love in this world. Lord, in your mercy. And great physician of soul and body, we pray for those in need of your healing. And we continue to bring before you Rick Lube, Chuck Hebert, Dick Anderson, Mary Ann Lees, Ron and Brenda Schlesinger, Mark Fuller, Philip Isaac, Rita Paul, Justin Baker, Rose Renner, Harold Stockstill, Sammy Harris, Georgette Yurchesky, Cindy Dalkey, Keith Onis, Chad Longauger, Kylie Young, Bob Schatz, Harper and Maggie Dickerhoff, Zach Adams, Howard Kirsten, Kirby Marino, and Mindy Falsabaka. Let your healing power attend them according to their need of body, soul, or mind. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. This time, let's take opportunity to greet each other with the peace of the Lord and share your name with those around you as well. Let's worship our Lord by receiving our offerings and our tithes.
Heavenly Father, receive now these gifts that we bring to you as symbols that we give our hearts and our lives to you, to your mission, to your ministry. Do as us and all that we are and have to extend your kingdom that the name of Jesus Christ might be proclaimed throughout the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are privileged once again to celebrate the gift of God's grace coming to us in a very special, tangible, real way. As we receive the true body and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ, veiled in earthly elements of bread and wine, to reaffirm to us that we are his forgiven children, and also to strengthen us for our faith walk here on this side of eternity. Let's stand as we celebrate this gift. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve who ate the forbidden fruit. And you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church forever and ever. Amen. Christ God, Christ is risen, Christ shall come again. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Welcome to the Lord's table. Jesus. 
forgiven now by the grace of Jesus. Go empowered by that grace to serve him with joy and to live in his peace now and always. Amen. Forgiven now by the grace of Jesus. Go empowered by that grace to serve him with joy and to live in his peace. Amen. of your Lord Jesus. Go empowered by that grace to serve him with joy and to live in his peace now and forevermore. Amen. of Jesus, go empowered by that grace to serve him with joy and to live in his peace.
this holy eating and drinking strengthen you and keep you in the true faith until life everlasting depart in his peace. Amen. Let's stand for our thanksgiving and after that we will go and since it is St. Patrick's Day I'm utilizing what's called St. Patrick's Breastplate which is a very strong Trinitarian confession written by that ancient church father St. Patrick. Oh give thanks unto the Lord for he is good. As often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we show the Lord's O God, the Father, fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We beseech you not to forsake your children, but evermore to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I bind unto myself today the strong name of the Trinity by invocation of the same, the three in one and one in three. His bursting from the spice of tomb, his writing up the heavenly way. His coming at the day of doom, I bind unto myself today. I bind unto myself today the power of God to hold and lead. His eyes to watch, his light to stay, his ears to hearken to my need. The wisdom of my God to teach, his hand to guide, his shield to ward. Against the demon snares of sin, the vice that gives temptation force. Or few or many, far or nigh, in every place and in all hours. Against their fierce hostility, I bind to me with the holy power. I bind unto myself the name, the strong name of the Trinity. Of whom all nature has creation, eternal Father, Spirit, Word. Praise the Lord of my salvation. Salvation be the Christ the Lord. Christ be with me. Christ be in me. Christ behind me. Christ before me. Christ beside me. Christ to win me. Christ to comfort me and restore me. Christ beneath me. Christ above me. Christ in the hearts of all that love me. Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every fear that fears me. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind always be at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face, the rains fall soft upon your fields, and until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand, and may God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless you, keep you, and give you his peace. Amen.
Go now in the Lord's peace.